Thank you very much. Uh, I should have sent a shorter introduction. I'll have to remember that next time. Um, the, I, I would also like to have sent to you uh, for each of you to have my um, PowerPoint demonstration, uh, but I do not have the proficiency with uh, my own computer to be able to do that. Uh, you may know that computers were only recently invented. Uh, in 1984, when I graduated from law school, the law firm that I went to, and every law firm, by the way, at that time, still had the Selectric typewriter. They did not yet have the idea of computers and printers. So I'm fairly ancient and uh, don't have proficiency yet with the PowerPoint demonstration, but I have sent it to uh, Professor, Professor Michelle, and he is in a position to share it with you. Um, if you would like to have a copy, just contact him and uh, you'll be able to have some of the details of uh, some of the statutes and cases that we'll review this evening. I call my uh, presentation Accessibility, Public Rights and Business Duties. So we're talking this evening about accessibility. And accessibility is about the identification and removal of barriers and the prevention of new barriers. And what kind of barriers are we talking about? Well, the accessibility legislation in Canada and in many provinces defines barriers as anything, including physical, architectural, technological, or attitudinal barriers anything that is based on information or communication or anything that is the result of a policy or a practice that hinders the full and equal participation in society of persons with an impairment. So that's uh, the, the new definition, the current definition of uh, what accessibility is all about. So if accessibility is the goal, how do we achieve it? Well, in Alberta, there are uh, both provincial and federal statutes that are intended to guide us, urge us, move us, require us to move towards the goal of accessibility. One is the Alberta Human Rights Act. The second is the Canadian Human Rights Act. And finally, Accessible Canada Act. Now these goals have been, in a, to a great extent, achieved in Alberta through the commitment of most businesses to the concept of accessibility. And let me just give you a personal example. Uh, my daughter is in a wheelchair and is working on or was working on her uh, doctorate in law at McGill. Uh, she plans to be in the uh, ac academy as a professor of law soon. And uh, in fact, I was just talking to her uh, yesterday about the uh, fact that she'll be um, putting in the final, cha final chapter of her thesis uh, later this week. But uh, I, do, I digress. When she uh, let me know that she was planning to uh, move to Calgary and make Calgary home after her time at McGill, uh, I decided to go out for a run on 4th uh, uh, Street in Southwest Calgary because that was where she was thinking of moving. And I went out for a run with my iPhone and I turned on the FaceTime and I started running from the Elbow River all the way to the Bow, which is about between 20 and 30 blocks. And the idea was to see whether or not the businesses and restaurants along 4th Street were accessible. And I didn't know what I would find because I hadn't really thought about it uh, specifically before. But as I ran along, I found that in Calgary on 4th Street, every business was accessible except one. And that was surprising because in the many years that I traveled to Montreal where she was at McGill, uh, there was probably just one accessible business and restaurant in the entire plateau where she had her condo. So the, the difference between Montreal, which is always considered to be you know, the world standard for a, an urban center that's inclusive and accessible. Uh, the fact is Montreal was not a very uh, 
uh, welcoming place for somebody in a wheelchair. And of course, you've probably remember the television news clip of the prime minister helping someone in a wheelchair to get out of a subway station because the subway station was not accessible. And uh, you'll remember the brand new hospital that was built in Montreal on a subway station. <laughs> they forgot to make the subway station accessible. And if you went to the hospital by subway, you wouldn't be able to get to the hospital because there was no, uh, no elevator and they had to put in the elevator afterwards. Uh, as my daughter travels around Calgary, all of the buses have ramps and they're all very happy to put the ramp down and she can travel even though she's uh, quadriplegic, she can travel without assistance from her home in her condo, which has a door that opens automatically and elevators and other doors that open automatically. She can travel anywhere in Calgary on bus, on LRT, without any assistance. And she can move about fairly excessively. Whereas in Montreal, because the buses are older and because the salt and the snow is worse, half the buses won't even stop for her, be, or did not stop for her because the ramps were rusted down and wouldn't even operate. So uh, the, uh, the fact is Calgary and Alberta, and I'm sure this is the same in Edmonton and other major centers in Alberta, because we're a newer place, we've been able to focus on things like accessibility and we've made the public places and the private businesses accessible. Um, let me just... Uh, uh, talk a little bit though about municipalities. Municipalities are an interesting um, organization. As you know from uh, looking at uh, business regulations and building codes and human rights statutes, businesses are required to make their um, publicly accessible um, space accessible to all. But what about the municipality that sets the rules? <laughs> um, ironically, the law does not directly apply to them. And we found that out very, uh, um, uh, again, ironically, when we went to a brand new building that had just been built by the city and it was touted as an accessible new place in an accessible area of Calgary called, um, uh, I believe it's called the East uh, Village. Uh, we went to the grand opening, and because it was so new, the uh, doors had not yet been hooked up, so they weren't hooked up to that little button that uh, electrically opens. So uh, we called the city manager to just give them a heads up. Hey, you know, uh, someone forgot to connect the wires. Well, instead of saying, thanks for the heads up, we'll go and get somebody right out there. We have an electrician. Uh, Instead, the manager took the time to tell us, well, the law doesn't apply to us. So we're not breaching any law when we don't make our building accessible. <laughs> so uh, it is, uh, it is uh, interesting the way municipalities and governments sometimes address this issue of accessibility. When the Calgary Herald called the uh, manager for a comment on the lack of accessibility and the fact that the door didn't work, uh, there was an interesting response. The next day, the mayor of Calgary announced a complete audit of all city facilities to make sure they all worked. So uh, sometimes it's not the law, it's possibly the, uh, the media that uh, sometimes shames us into action. Let's talk about human rights legislation uh, to begin with, because human rights legislation goes back to the time of World War II, right after World War II, there was a recommitment of the world to human rights because human rights had been so abused during and before the war. And one of the ideas was human rights codes. And so across the world, at least in the Western world, including Canada, human rights statutes started to be adopted. But it wasn't until the uh, 1980s that we actually got the idea of the reasonable accommodation requirement. And interestingly enough, that accommodation requirement was first explained by the Supreme Court of Canada in a case involving 
a Seventh-day Adventist employee of Sears. Uh, Simpson Sears had an employee that did not want to work on the Sabbath. So that employee asked for an accommodation. They did not want to work on Saturday and they were told, uh, sorry, but uh, the work requirement here is that you work on Saturday because we're open on Saturday. Uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Human Rights Tribunal and the disability communities in, uh, were invested in the fight and actually intervened in the courts because they knew that an accommodation law and an accommodation decision in favor of someone with a need for religious accommodation would also be of benefit to those who had a physical uh, limitation and needed an accommodation from their employer for that, for that uh, particular disability. Um, and the Supreme Court did in fact rule in favor of the Seventh-day Adventist employee and required Simpson Sears to require, uh, was required to provide Mrs. O'Malley with a, an accommodation for her uh, religious belief. And that case became the precedent that was used not just in the area of religious liberty, but also in the area of accommodation for those who needed to have accommodation with respect to goods and services, retail uh, establishments, accommodations, and other facilities that are available to the public. Also, landlord and tenant law, as well, of course, employment law. All of these areas of human interaction are governed by the same human rights code. And we have two codes in Canada because some, in, some businesses are governed by a provincial regulator and some businesses, because of the way our constitution is created, are governed by the federal government. And so there are, there's a need for two human rights codes. Generally speaking, it doesn't matter how the codes have been drafted. The courts have generally said they both mean exactly the same thing and they both require exactly the same kind of accommodation by retailers, by employers and by landlords and others who provide public services. And that duty is a duty of acting reasonably. So if the accommodation were to require you to build a $1 million ramp and your business does $100 worth of business each day, the courts might say that's unreasonable and would not require an employer to make that kind of an accommodation. Whereas if the business is netting a million dollars a day and the cost of a ramp is a hundred dollars, then you can count on the courts and the human rights tribunals requiring the business to make that kind of what is known as a reasonable accommodation. And the courts have sometimes said that reasonable accommodation means a cost that does not create an undue hardship. What that means in each case, we don't know. But for example, in the case of, let's say a religious accommodation, if someone wanted to work on a television station that only uh, broadcast football games that occurred on Saturdays and they wanted to be accommodated and uh, not be required to work on Saturdays, the courts might say, since that's the only day this television broadcast operates, that uh, the employer would be undergoing an undue hardship if they had to move the football games to another day of the week. So that's the kind of analysis that the court takes. It's a matter of reasonableness. What's reasonable in the circumstance? And the employee or the disabled person is not entitled to use the law to require the employer to act in a way that would be unreasonable and create an undue hardship for the uh, employer or the retailer or, or other public um, facility operator. Now, in the, uh, well, from about the year 2000 on, there was a growing sense that human rights tribunals were not the best place to deal with accessibility and issues with respect to disability, that there should be something proactive 
in the law that would require businesses to do something about the creation of accessible space, even if there was no complaint, even if they did not at the time have an employee or a customer that required it of them through making a complaint to the Human Rights Commission. And so Ontario in 2005, and then later the Accessibility for Manitobans Act in Manitoba, and then in 2017, just two, three years ago, Nova Scotia. So ahead of the current accessibility uh, law at the federal level, at least three provinces brought in laws that required accessible space, regardless of whether or not there was someone demanding that a reasonable accommodation be made for them. Alberta, interestingly enough, uh, does not have a separate uh, statute at this time with respect to accessibility. Um, and it may be because uh, there isn't that much of a demand for it because of the fact that uh, everyone is uh, feeling the demand of the customer uh, or the employee for this kind of an accommodation. And so they are relying, relying upon the educational function that uh, we find within human rights statutes because human rights commissions have utilized their position within society and their budgets to educate the public, including employers, landlords, and retailers about the requirements of the law with respect to accessibility. Uh, there's another set of statutes that are not specifically addressing accessibility, but that are probably even more important to most individuals who need access to a public space, and that is the building codes. Again, since about uh, the World War, World War II, there has been a focus within building codes on a standard for uh, the kind of building that would need to be built in order to give access to the greatest number of individuals. Now, at first, uh, this was influenced through the federal uh, programs that funded new homes for veterans. And so veterans were coming back from the war and they needed a place to live. And the government of Canada said, we'll fund new buildings for you and mortgages for those buildings, but they have to follow the code that we will establish. Well, that set a standard that the provincial building codes set and then municipalities of course adopted. So three levels of government now do impose requirements with respect to accessibility within public buildings as well as within private residences. And those particular rules are frankly of more, more important to the individual in a wheelchair because they need access. Um, when they arrive at that building, they can't go and make a complaint to the Human Rights Commission before they go through the door. Uh, when they show up, the building needs to be accessible. The uh, other thing to keep in mind is that it is a whole lot less expensive to make the building accessible in the first place than it is to try to retrofit the building later. And so it makes sense for employees uh, or employers and retailers to make the building accessible in the first place. And certainly the architects in Canada have uh, spent a great deal of time and their schools have spent a great deal of time over the last few years focusing on how to change the way design is done. Uh, fewer use, uses of stairs, more use of areas to roll and to not uh, provide barriers to, to those that need access to buildings. In fact, again, my daughter who was working on her a thesis in Montreal was asked by the uh, uh, Architects Association, the, the National Architects Association to work a summer as a, a fellow, if you will, on the subject of how to better design buildings so that there would be access to those buildings for individuals beginning with the design and going through the engineering rather than trying to place an elevator on later or chip out some uh, um, sidewalks like they did in Calgary. They had the, again, the 
I, I'll take a shot at the East Village in Calgary again. They created this East Village with supposedly top of the line first uh, class accessibility. And then they had a little bit of a cement bump at each corner so that if you were in a wheelchair, they, you came down hard instead of having a smooth uh, cement slide, if you will, off of the sidewalk. Uh, and in fact, I saw once a, an individual, again, with on their own, with their own wheelchair, go over one of those bumps and be kicked out of their wheelchair because of that. So the city had to go through and put in the jackhammers on each and every one of those corners and take out that little bump because someone who in the design space was not thinking about the idea that not only did you need to have a little bit of a slope, but you needed to have a complete slope because wheelchair users typically do not have uh, good control over their bodies. They need the wheelchair both for uh, rolling around, but also support as they move about. So um, let me take you now to, well, just before we leave provincial uh, statutes, I've been talking a lot about wheelchairs, but it's every kind of access that's covered by these statutes. For example, the Accessibility for Ontario, Ontarians with Disabilities Act of 2005 just adopted a major new amendment that took effect on January 1, 2021, and that is access to the World Wide Web. It is now a requirement for provincial businesses who want to advertise and use the web to make their websites accessible to those who might have sight problems or other or hearing problems or other problems that are not that, that make normal computer access uh, available to those with a disability that may not be um, of a, a type that would be addressed through a wheelchair, but maybe addressed through other, um, you know, CNIB or other kinds of accommodation. And so this is, uh, the way they've done it is they didn't make up the rules themselves. Instead, they went to the World Wide Web and the World Wide Web Consortium has a web content guideline for those who want to make their websites accessible and it's called the World Wide Web Content Guidelines 2.0. So now businesses have a place to go in Ontario and in fact are required to go to that uh, set of guidelines and ensure that their websites are accessible to those who need assistance with access. Let me uh, close the formal part of my uh, discussion with you tonight with a reference to uh, the Accessible Canada Act. The first uh, minister to lead the development of this act was in fact an Albertan, a Calgary-based minister who himself was a quadriplegic in a uh, wheelchair, uh, his name uh, Kent, and uh, he uh, was a friend who uh, worked with me and uh, with my daughter Stephanie on the Accessible Canada Act and uh, was working on pushing this through. Um, then there was a cabinet shuffle and he wasn't able to actually be there when the legislation came into force, but uh, he was the one that started it. And the goal of this uh, statute was and is the creation of what they call, quote, Canada without barriers on or before January 1, 2040 by the identification and removal of barriers and the prevention of new barriers. Now, the only limitation that we find with this particular statute is, of course, that it's federal. And that means that it only applies to federal organizations, things like Canada Post, things like the airlines, or trains, interprovincial pipelines, um, the RCMP, um, the military. So anything that is federally regulated would be subject to the Accessible Canada Act. Uh, but this standard that will only be applicable to federally regulated businesses will no doubt have an influence on provincial laws that regulate in this area, as those provincial laws, the ones that I mentioned from Ontario, Manitoba, and Nova Scotia, 
obviously had an impact on the legislation that was brought in uh, just recently in 2019 by the federal government. Uh, the duties that this legislation places upon each business that is governed by this statute, and it's not just business. Fortunately, it does also cover the federal government itself, but there is a requirement to prepare and publish accessibility plans, to set up a feedback process, and to prepare and publish progress reports on the work that each of these organizations and government departments is making towards the 2040 goal of a barrier-free Canada. So that is the law that uh, applies to accessibility in Canada and uh, a little bit of uh, um, a personal perspective on it. Uh, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you may have on uh, the uh, subject of the human rights statutes that govern the uh, design and uh, national or provincial uh, building codes that uh, set certain standards or the accessibility legislation that's now in place federally and provincially. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Michelle, to manage the uh, questions, or if you'd like me to, I'm happy to just take them directly. So we, I'm just inviting uh, people to watch time. We would want to raise their hands uh, to ask questions, to type in their questions in the chat and Janae would be managing that for us. Um, any question, please? Okay, so let me ask the first one then. <laughs> uh, is there any exception for older buildings, for example, for a building code, is there they need to be uh, if the building is not appropriate for a new ramp or any facility, um, is there exception in the law for that? There is with respect to the building code rules, but not with respect to the Accessible Canada or the uh, provincial statutes that govern. Uh, and there isn't within the human rights statutes as long as the accommodation is reasonable. So if it is and a, mod a modification that is not going to create an undue hardship for the employer, the landlord, or the, the business owner, then that would be a requirement even if it was an older building. Now, the, there is one exception to what I just said, and that is if something has been designated an historical site. Um, the, uh, the, the historical site, <laughs> Uh, legislation does clash directly with these three sets of laws. There's no doubt about it. So how do we deal with it? Well, there has been a balance that has been developed, but generally speaking, the historical sites regulator have, have had the trump card, if you will, and maybe I shouldn't use that word, has had the ability to, to make the uh, building historically true to its original construction, even if that means that it is not accessible. Um, I could talk about some of the very interesting buildings across Canada who've had battles and often um, when there is public attention focused on it, the uh, individuals making the decisions, the board of directors that is responsible often does make an accommodation even though that does mean that it's not true to its original um, construction. Um, but let me give you one example of where really there's no excuse. Um, and I'm gonna name names because I don't mind. Um, Lululemon had a store in Calgary um, and they decided to move stores to a historically protected building as they went into this historically protected building, they were allowed to completely take out the flooring. And so they completely took it out and they replaced it with cement. Originally, there was a step that was there. And so in order to be true to what was originally there, they created a step out of the cement. <laughs> 
So they are the only location, the only business on all of 4th Street in Calgary that is not accessible because they artificially created a barrier that wasn't even necessary under the historical site development plans that were required of them. But because the designer, the architect, wasn't thinking about accessibility, the designer built in the same kind of barrier that had originally existed. And that's one of those places or cases where there is no doubt that uh, someone, either the architect, the engineer, or probably more likely the building uh, inspector or the um, planner that had approved the building should have noticed that uh, development and should have said, no, we're not going to have you build a new building that is true to the original uh, and create a, an artificial barrier that doesn't need to be there, that um, doesn't um, in fact preserve the original building, but instead, uh, quote, preserves its inaccessibility. Uh, so what really is required most of the time is that we just think about it. And if we think about it, we can find that it doesn't cost any more to make something accessible. And it often does not take that much money to make a building accessible. And uh, so there are, you know, the short answer to your question is the word is reasonable. And in most cases, if it's reasonable, it will be required. If it's not reasonable, it will not be required of an older building. Okay, so there is a question. Is there a complaints procedure for the Accessible Canada Act, similar to the Human Rights Act? And if so, what is the difference between making a complaint under the Human Rights Code versus the Accessible Canada Act? Uh, there is, there is a process. Um, it is a process that is, um, I would say the difference between the two is that when you have a complaint under the human rights legislation, uh, it is a um, very, I would call it judicial. That means it is legalistic and it is based upon the concept of a complainant and a defendant and uh, a finding that someone has made a mistake and must correct that mistake. It's not a matter of fault. It's just that there is an individual, a landlord, a tenant, or sorry, a landlord or an employer uh, or some retailer who has not complied with the duty to provide a reasonable accommodation. It can take years. Uh, we had one case that went to the human right, went from the Human Rights Commission in British Columbia to the Supreme Court of Canada in eight years. So the human rights process is entirely uh, unsuited to resolving problems for individuals who need access. The federal process is intended to identify solutions. There isn't a, uh, it's not a matter of being reasonable. It's just simply, you must comply. If you are a federal, um, if you are a federal uh, building uh, owner, uh, an owner that is regulated by federal statute, then you must comply with the accessible uh, Canada Act, and uh, there is a process in the legislation. I, I don't have that process right here in front of me, but it is not a, it is, there's not an independent tribunal that will um, be responsible for uh, this kind of complaint. Instead, the complaint is dealt with and I don't want to use the word bureaucrat in a negative sense. In my CV talks a lot, getting rid of red tape. So it's not about bureaucrats who are in a negative sense. Instead, it's someone who is responsible within the organization to, to actually resolve the complaint. And I would, I would uh, use the freedom of information process as a good analogy. 
Uh, I don't know if you've had any discussions about this uh, type of legislation, but the idea in a freedom of information uh, process is that you make the request to the actual organization and then that organization decides whether or not they will or are required by the law to um, provide the information to you. And so that would be the first step in the legislation governing the uh, Canadian or Accessible Canada Act. And that legislation would give the opportunity to, whether it's a Canada Post or an airline, to resolve the problem. And then only if that did not work, would you then take it up to the, uh, and as I said, the, the process uh, uh, in fact has a, not, it's not just a matter of you making complaints. There is actually a, a requirement that there be an accessible plan and the, that plan take into account the need to be accessible. And then the progress on those reports must be uh, provided to uh, the federal government. So it's more of a, if you will, a transparent process that uh, is achieved through um, a process of uh, give and take between the individual and the federal organization. Um, some have said that this is not enough, that there should be more of a hammer in the hands of some uh, governing body. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. And I think it will come down to a question of whether or not federally regulated organizations, in fact, respond positively and get ahead of, uh, hit ahead of the issue or whether they lag behind. And if they lag behind, I can expect parliament to take steps to impose more of a human rights tribunal type of process upon the access uh, Accessible Canada Act. Thank you. The next question. If I decide to run a business from my home, for example, a bakery that operates from my kitchen into my backyard, how would that work with regards to the laws concerning accessibility? This is with the assumption I purchased the home before I got the idea and all the permits required to operate. Uh, no problem in that case. Um, if you're operating in your backyard, uh, your backyard is where you are inviting individuals to, to come and uh, receive whatever it is that you have to sell, or you may in fact not invite the public at all. And in fa fact, as we have learned over the last year, you may find that the best way to do business is to deliver it to the individual wherever they are. So just to be clear, the requirement both in the human rights legislation and in the um, uh, building codes and in Accessible Canada legislation is where you have the public invited. So where the public have a right of access because you've invited them to do business with you there. Those are the spaces that must be accessible. You do not have to redo your bedroom if you don't need it. You don't have to redo your own kitchen if you don't need it. Uh, and you don't need to redo any part of your personal home if you're not inviting individuals into your home. And, and frankly, if you don't have a business permit, you shouldn't be inviting them to your home because that will get your neighbors to start complaining. And of course, that's been one of the big issues during this time of lockdown is that individuals have in fact invited people to come to their home since they can't uh, be at the office and uh, individuals have been going to their homes and there's two problems with that. Number one, it breaks the lockdown, but number two, the individual is operating a business out of their home without a business license for their home. And so neighbors uh, are sometimes uh, calling the uh, uh, business license or the uh, public health lines and saying, my neighbor's breaking the law and they shouldn't be doing this there business, uh, their clients are parking in my driveway or they're uh, blocking the road and this is um, unlawful. So there are a number of things you would have to be thinking about, but uh, assuming you had a business license and you, assuming the zoning was correct and you could invite somebody into your backyard, your backyard would have to be accessible uh, 
for those individuals, whether they're employees or the public who are invited into that public space. Thank you. Other questions? So I'm going to ask the next one. I was thinking about, you know, most workplaces, the they go regularly on the, um, reviewing performance of their employees. And some people would take more time to adapt and to perform. Is there any provision in the law uh, that would require an employer to accommodate employees that would need more time to adapt and to perform? Yes, absolutely. Uh, because uh, the human rights legislation it covers both mental and physical disability. And so if you have an individual who can perform the task, but just requires additional time to perform the task, uh, and it is not because of, quote, laziness, <laughs> you know, watching TV, uh, <laughs> I'll tell a story on myself. I remember when I was working at the book bindery, when I was in grade 10 at uh, what is now Berman University and Parkview Adventist Academy, but at the time was the high school division of Canadian um, Union College. And the book bindery was doing book binding for most of the libraries in Alberta. And one of the books that they bound was the French cartoon called Asterix. And for whatever reason, I was just fascinated with that cartoon. And you could read through it real fast. Well, instead of binding from time to time, I would sneak a, a quick read through one of these books instead of doing my job. And uh, there were times when the manager came and had a little heart to heart with me and said, maybe you should uh, be working instead of reading. This is, uh, <laughs> this is where you work. You can read on your own time. And uh, so, yes, uh, as long as there is an actual disability uh, with respect to the uh, ability to perform work at a certain rate, uh, if the employer can accommodate, then the employer must accommodate in that kind of case, just as with any other access issue or uh, any other kind of human rights uh, disability or uh, limitation that are faced by individuals because the, the goal of both Accessible Canada Act and the human rights statutes in Canada is to make it possible for everyone to find a place within society. Uh, the word now is inclusion. I was just, uh, I chaired the University of Calgary School of Public Policy and we were just having a meeting yesterday and uh, they called it the inclusion uh, diversity and equity a statement. And so that's in fact, what is required is inclusion because that's the goal. Be, and the thought is, is, looking at it purely from a utilitarian perspective, we will be less of a society. We will have less if we don't include the um, energy and the vision of each and every one within society. And, and that includes both those you know, religious diversity, um, uh, gender diversity, every kind of diversity and every kind of limitation we want to accommodate because we believe that society will be better if we do. And uh, that's why uh, about a hundred and about a hundred years ago now in Canada, the vote was given to women. Why? Because there was a general understanding that the decisions that just the men were making were half as good as if the decisions were made by both men and women. And that's the same as with these individuals who are working in the workplace. Yes, they might be slower, but the workplace and society generally will be less if we do not include them within the workforce. Thank you. Here's that there is another question in the chat. Yes. Are there any recent cases that have dealt with accessibility under either the Accessible Canada Act or the human rights legislation? Uh, not Accessible Canada yet. It's too brand new. Um, but um, I can tell you about two cases. Uh, one uh, in, um, or three cases. One in 2014, uh, Saxon and uh, a numbered company in Ontario. 
uh, Noseworthy and Ontario, and then in 2020, Jacobson and Strataplan. And this was a, a case where there was a, an issue with respect to accessibility in a condominium. And um, in fact, I was involved in one human rights case involving condominiums, and it's the same principle. Again, my involvement has been in the area of religious liberty, and we had a case that uh, was out of Montreal where a Jewish family wanted to have a little tent on their balcony during uh, the um, Feast of Unleavened Bread, I believe, and uh, or no, Feast of Tabernacles, that's it. And they had it on their balcony and the condo association said, you cannot do that. Um, and uh, the argument from the lawyer in the Supreme Court of Canada was, we discriminate equally against everyone. They said, we discriminate against Christians by not allowing Christmas trees. We discriminate against Jewish people by preventing them from having tabernacles. And we even discriminate against Pakistanis. Now, that's a direct quote. So I know what they didn't mean that, but I think there was something lost in the translation. I'm sure they meant Muslims, but uh, they didn't say that. So uh, that is the reality. The reality is that the courts will require condo associations and will require uh, anyone who is providing something to the public to, in fact, allow um, accessibility and to provide accessibility and to modify if it's reasonable and it's not an undue hardship. And so I, I'm happy, well, what I can tell you is the uh, citations for those three cases that I just mentioned are in the PowerPoint, demo, uh, PowerPoint materials that I provided to Professor Michelle and you can uh, find those uh, through him and then look them up online. Uh, they should be available. And uh, I know that Michelle, Professor Michelle can send to me later any specific question. If you, can't, if you can't find those cases, I'm happy to send them to Professor Michelle so that he can share them with you if someone uh, cannot find them online. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And um, th there is a general question I would like to ask is that um, what my uh, students preparing to enter the workplace, expect in terms of accommodation? That is a broad general type of question. Is there any type of accommodation for them out there when entering the workplace for the first time or? Um, yes, in, in, so three things to keep in mind when it comes to uh, starting in the workplace. The first is that you should pay attention to what the employer is asking about what you can deliver to help make the employer successful. That's what they need to know about. They don't need to know about any of the things that you need accommodated. In fact, the legislation prohibits them from asking you things like, are you married? Are you pregnant? Are you disabled? Are you of a particular religion? What is your race or ethnic origin? What is anything that is governed by the human rights legislation? They cannot ask you those questions. That's not relevant. Uh, and the, one of the best models that I ever found was a client of ours called London Drugs. London Drugs had a policy, and I believe still has a policy, of when they hire you, they do the interview and they hire you, period. After they've hired you, they then say to you, can you please tell us whether you are available on any particular day or whether you require an accommodation, not just with respect to the days of work, but also accommodation with respect to any of the needs that you may have specially that are unique to you. So they don't ask why you have those needs. They don't ask why you need those days off. They don't require you to disclose your religious beliefs. They just say, we like you as an employee, we're going to utilize your services to the extent you're able to provide them, but we're not going to create an awkward situation where you have to explain your religious beliefs or you have to explain how you're disabled in one particular way or another. You are valued because we think you can do a job. And as long as you can do the job, then you have a place here. And so the first point is don't 
lead with what you can't do. Don't tell them you can't work on Saturday. Don't tell them that you are in a wheelchair. Don't tell them that you uh, maybe have a vision problem. That is not relevant until they have hired you. Once they've hired you, then it is relevant as you talk about how they are going to make a reasonable accommodation. And it may be that they can't. And in that case, then it's your duty to back out gracefully because if you are in fact, um, let's say you were blind and you were wanting to be the play-by-play -play commentator for Hockey Night in Canada, it would be an unreasonable request for the employer to find an accommodation based upon the technology that I'm aware of today. Now, in the future, there may be some way to, to accommodate that, but right now that just would not be accommodated. So number one, lead with your best foot, with what you can do to make your employer successful, not with why you need an accommodation. Number two, the employer is not entitled to ask you those questions. And if they do ask you that question, the best way to answer that is, um, I do not feel comfortable answering that question. And that way you're not slapping them in the face and telling them you are um, breaking the law. Mm. Now you can, if you want to, if you feel bold and want to take a chance, you know, feel free, but I would there's no need to. Just simply say, I don't feel comfortable answering that question. And all of a sudden they'll turn red and they'll realize they stepped over the line. And sometimes people just get curious and they ask questions they shouldn't. And so you're free to set your own boundaries. And then the third thing is that after you are hired, that is when we talk about what is required in terms of an accommodation. And if they are not willing to accommodate you because they, are, they don't think that they need to accommodate your religious beliefs or your disability or any other, any other thing that is unique about you that requires accommodation under the legislation, then um, a complaint can be made. And uh, more often than not these days, employers know better. They hire good HR people who've been trained in it. But if they don't, then there are individuals working for the Human Rights Commissions, both federally and provincially, who do have the job of going out and talking to an employer and or a landlord or a retailer or someone else and helping them understand what the law is. And if the organization is willing to mend its ways, then that's the end of it. Because this is not about uh, finding fault and blame and penalizing. It's, these are not penal statutes where we're trying to catch you in breaking the law. What we're trying to do is modify behavior so that the behavior does not act in an exclusive way where it excludes you from a job or from a tenancy or a place to live of some other type or from uh, being able to shop at your favorite Lululemon. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, that is a huge contribution to what uh, the Small Business Center has been doing in campus. And thank you for helping the School of Business out in this endeavor. And uh, it was a pleasure to have you tonight. I don't know if you just, if you have a couple more minutes to hang out, we're going to end the formal sessions here. And um, I appreciate that on behalf of um, Berman University, the School of Business and all students, um, uh, Mr. Chidier, I thank you very much. Um, and uh, we appreciate you talking with us tonight. Uh, thank you. And um, 